brown and white butterfly has landed. I have, I have some strip shopping to do, a train to catch. There's only a few dozen zlotys in my pocket, but the keys jingle when I brush them. The street is getting peopled. Pockets are filling up. This one is called, it doesn't have a cool title at all, I'm afraid. Uh, Receding Planets of the Roman Tree. You wouldn't believe it. Wait. <laughs> 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 a cool, really cool person. Say that, that, that again. What is the title again? Yeah, the title is Receding Planets of the Roman Tree. <laughs> but that's actually descriptive. If anybody saw the Roman Tree, one would know that there's a cluster of those wonderful red or orange berries uh, that perhaps look like planets. So I didn't really think I was doing anything naughty, but it turned out I did. We see in the planets of the Roman tree, there's always something more important. Little bottles half filled with cardiamide and caffeine, still alive. Even when empty, they're alive since they stand by the basket of bread and the homemade gingerbread mix and the still untouched jar of herb honey. The untidied apartment is still alive. Not something, it's life that is more important. The enlarged liver doesn't have to mean the worst. It could have tied itself with almonds, brown bread, and a bit of pork. The table drawer full of odds and ends would no longer be alive if it were put straight. If books were ordered in the closet, the photos in the album, the rest of the dirty clothes washed, the room repainted, they too would no longer live. It's necessary to eat, take medicines, put the bowl by the bed, get out of bed, make tea and call the doctor who won't wipe his shoes, but mechanically writing out the prescription will say, you have a nice picture there, man. As a matter of fact, very nice. Especially in the afternoon, when it catches the sun. <laughs> out of town. Years later, the water the water still drips. There's no one to tighten the valve. It courses through all the pipes, down to the septic tank. Next morning in the cellar, I start the motor with a stick. It shakes and rumbles and chirps. The switch is broken, is all. At night, the water arrives illegally underground to the, to the very grave where last spring parsley sprouted, and at the fruit beside it, feral sorrel darkens, tastily and tartly, like clandestine sex. The motor lifts the spirits and returns the night's deductions. It's morning, I hum softly, a stranger will replace me. In the cellar, a stream of light rinses the window grate, the pulses strikes the meter, I catch my rhythm on the stairs. And for memory's sake, I hum as I pass the septic tank, a fluid underground song about sorrow and a stranger. A maple leaf. A maple leaf with the sun shining through it at the end of summer is beautiful, but not excessively so. And even an ordinary electric train passing by nearly 300 yards away makes music light and unobtrusive. And yet to be remembered for some, for its own sort of usefulness perhaps, or even instructiveness. The world somehow doesn't quite say it knows everything, has a good memory, and above all, won't show it off. And uh, Maybe a couple of poems from outside the book. Uh, to end it. Uh, yes, 
This one is called Rain. The Rain. That's called Rain. The raindrop's shadow was crawling on my lapel like a fly. While the plane was changing lanes and position, and the engine was shuddering. Toronto is rather flat, not visible from the air. On top of that, the wind was crumpling words. <laughs> on the way up, the rain on the pane first wandered like mercury, then got beaten to bits and trickled off. And the last one that I'm going to read is called Zagari in August, and it was translated by Bill Martin together with Christian Hawking. Uh, and I, I need to say that because I, I kind of like this little anecdote about it. It's called Zagari in August. Zagari is a very small village on the Polish Lithuanian border with a rather huge and lovely Gawadush Lake, which is which we share with Lithuania, our neighbor, because we also have neighbors. <laughs> and um, we, the Poles, <laughs> and Zagari is spelled with a little uh, yeah. Their critical mark, in order to get the lovely sound of z, you need to get that dot. Probably. Otherwise, it's it's like in your language a z, which would be terribly boring. But what they, <laughs> what they what they what they happened not to see was their critical mark. So what what they thought it was, uh, they thought it was simply zegary in August. And Zegary in Polish is not the name of this little village, but it's, it, it, it is clocks. Zegary is a clock. So really the title would, would have been Clocks and August. <laughs> I love this concept because they, the, the, this title is pretty pretextual. It doesn't really matter that much, so it seemed to me that it, it could be that. But because we discovered, we discovered the missing dot, we change it back into Zagari, which now is even more boring than without it. But it's, I, I'm telling you about this little thing because it seems to me that uh, that's really how how culture is fun and writing is fun. That in those little misreadings, that the beautiful misreadings that sort of push things forward and make you think about even more beautiful things that you read. Well, Zagari in August. And yet the grapes this year have not forgotten. They still remember how to be good. Despite all the days marked scrupulously in the calendar, and despite the very different places, since next to the date you could enter a name from the calendar of places, and even now, nothing good can be thought of someone like you. Only the days carry on, oblivious to other days, regardless of, of whatever happened between them. Long evenings, short nights. Hmm. And what happened? Tell me, if you know. Okay. Well, that's a <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Piot, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bill. It's lovely to, no, it's lovely to hear you read. Um, and uh, um, thank you all for being here. And uh, Piot and I did, a, did an interview about 10 years ago. Um, for this magazine, 
and this is the first time, I mean, we've had many conversations since, but it's the first time we've spoken in a, a more or less formal uh, format. Um, so I'm curious to know what will, what will come out of it. Um, but I would like to, uh, I'd like to mention that in, in the earlier interview that we did, we talked largely about Piot's uh, um, translations of American poets. Um, and I was rereading it recently, and I, I, I regretted, in a, in, in a way, having focused so much on that and not having focused more on his poetry. And so I thought, and, and on Polish poetry generally, but really about his work. Um, and so I thought it would actually be uh, good to, to really um, concentrate now more about Piotr's own poetics and, uh, and, and the work he's been doing. Um, a lot of which is in this book, um, which I'm sure many of you have already, but if you don't, it's outside. And this is not the most recent. Where is the most recent? Mm. There's another one. It's almost there. the most recent. Almost the most recent. This is another book called Days and Nights, which came out a few years ago. Um, and the last two poems that Piot read were from this book. Um, this is the last one that I, that I know, uh, uh, even though I mistranslate words from it. <laughs> um, he, he, took, he took it badly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a lot of very messy notes here, but what, one thing I'd like to I'd like to begin with is uh, something that comes up in um, the poem Hygiene, and. In, in, in this poem, he has the line, um, you know, it begins with, the, with this impersonal form. Today, for the first time in months, it, it stopped at one pack. And then the next line, this is how it sounds best when the impersonal form gets into the ear by itself, when it speaks by itself. And something that I find very interesting about Piotr's poems, um, about your poems, is You can say Piotr's me. Yes, you. Uh, I'm not sure who I'm speaking to here, actually. But um, one thing I find very interesting is, uh, very compelling, more than interesting, is the way in which a, an excruciatingly intimate detail, a uh, very personal detail um, from everyday life, inhabits the same poetic space as uh, a kind of um, impersonal, sensibility, a disinterestedness, um, a kind of universal ambition in, in the poem. And I guess the question that I have about you is, uh, I'm not sure if this is something that's intentional or if it's something that, that is systematic in a way or that you're conscious of it, but I'd be interested to know what, what, you, what you think uh, about that um, double uh, I guess sensibility, or this, this, you know, this, the very personal on the one hand, the very intimate detail, and the universal, uh, generalized, and, and maybe even transcendental impulse in your in your own work. At least something that I found. Maybe, maybe I'm completely wrong, but perhaps you could say well, something. I, 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 I'd be happy to say something on the subject, but I'm not sure how much sense I, I am able to make making comments about myself, but I will do my best and uh, try to answer what you sort of reply, give you a, a comment. And, uh, and uh, yes, I think that that would be part of the ambition to, to connect these two. One of the, one of the uh, problems that I used to have and still have whenever I bump into that in, in contemporary Polish poetry, perhaps more than other poetry is written in other languages because when you read it in translation, you never know about so about all those specific things.